Uh, my name is Jessica Clemens. I'm the Interim Director of College Libraries at SUNY ESF, e SUNY ESF, and I want to thank you all for joining us today for SUNY Open Access Week. This webinar series is part of the SUNY Council of Library Directors' strategic plan to bring awareness and understanding of open access to 64 SUNY campuses and beyond. And I see we have some of those and beyond folks today, so thanks especially to you all for coming. In addition to our terrific speakers, this series was brought to you by the work of a talented and dedicated committee made up of members from various SUNY campuses, SUNY Press, and the Central New York Library Resources Council. You can see a list of our members in the SUNY Open Access website, and I'll share that in the chat window in just a few moments. We hope that this webinar series will launch deeper discussions and involvement in open access for our community. Our friends at CLRC will be monitoring the chat in case there are any technical problems. I want to say um, a special thank you to CLRC for hosting this Adobe Connect event. Um, Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, greetings from a kind of overcast and gray Buffalo in New York. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about starting and sustaining an open access journal. Um, yeah, as introduced earlier, I'm Molly Peremsky. I'm the digital collections librarian here at the University of Buffalo. And I'm Amy Bill. I'm the university archivist. And we're both editors of The Reading Room. Okay. And Amy, we can't hear you. It looks like your microphone got muted by by accident. So I think. Oh, okay. How's this? Is that better? That that's that's perfect. And if you just want to start over, as soon as you clicked over to the other slide, it looks like uh, the mic got stopped. So take two. All right. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So our agenda for today, we're going to break it up into three parts: how and why we started an open access journal. Um, kind of how did we choose the platform and then we're going to wrap up with challenges lessons learned and advice we have for others who want to do the same thing okay okay can you can still hear us okay so what is the journal so the reading room a journal of special collections is an open access publication a journal we started in 2014 um, and our audience uh, includes all um, special collections environments, and that includes public libraries, academic libraries, museums, historical societies, and corporate environments. Um, for example, you, like the Coke Museum, the Coca-Cola Museum in Atlanta has a, a special collection. 
Um, we're a peer-reviewed journal and our viewers consist mainly of librarians, but uh, some of our authors are not librarians, but academics working in special collections and using special collections in their research. So why did we create the reading room? Well, there's two main reasons. The first, um, to be blunt, was a little bit selfish. Um, at the time in 2014, both Molly and I were tenure track, and we each had articles in mind regarding our special collections, but felt that there was no appropriate journal for publication at that time. Um, I was writing an article about a local historical event that would be um, kind of interesting to those in the region of Western New York. And I identified two options for publishing. One was a widely read local history magazine. Unfortunately, that was not peer reviewed and that wouldn't have worked for me. Um, the second was history journals and those are peer reviewed, but I don't have a PhD in history. I don't have a PhD in anything to be frank. Um, and it really seemed unlikely that they would publish that work and Molly uh, was also in a similar situation mm -hmm. and I um, when I started this job um, I was tasked with being the curator for the Polish room which is a localized special collection we here have here and it started off as a, a closed stacks non-circulating uh, special collection and then went to a circulating special collection which posed some problems and then when I started I brought it back to being a closed stack special collections with some some changes um and i wanted to write a case study about that um but there was not really a good place that would be interested in a, a good peer-reviewed journal um that would be interested in this story So we felt um, that there was a gap in the literature and that there was kind of a lack of a comprehensive open access, uh, specifically open access, special collections journal that included contributions from all special collections stakeholders. And by that, we mean librarians and archivists, but also students and users. Uh, many of the top tier journals in special collections, some of them are still, they can be online too, but they still have um, print. And they often have pricey subscription or organizational membership fees. And we saw two problems with that model, at least for us. Um, those access costs can be prohibitive. Um, and there's also a time lag for print. Traditionally, a special collections librarian would present their research findings or a case study at regional or national conferences um, before the results were published in a journal. Um, with many times a year or more between project completion and dissemination by a publication. And while there's nothing wrong with print-based journals and the present and publish system per se, uh, we really wanted to offer an open access, online and free peer-reviewed journal to be more accessible and to publish articles quickly to increase responsiveness to challenges and successes in our field. Um, one, just a brief example in archives, you know, there's a move towards archive space, which is a content management tool. Um, it's open source, and this is what everybody's kind of moving to. But with the old print and present model, it's simply too long to find out how colleagues at your peer institutions are using this tool, what's working and what isn't. And we all need that information as soon as possible to inform our migration. And the traditional model kind of interferes with this a bit. Um, also, library literature is often cited only by other library literature. And one of our goals um, and our hopes is that um, some of our articles might provide an opportunity to change that. And that's by engaging our users to also be uh, authors. So our solution uh, was to create an open access journal, one without subscription or membership fees with a much faster timeline from submission to publication. At the reading room, we tried to make a, have a conscious effort to expand our submission base and include articles from those using special collections. Um, so that's what I was talking about, kind of having people um, cite library articles that are kind of outside of the library field, um, as well as students working with special collections. 
So for example, if a researcher has used a unique collection material for their research article, why not publish that article for a special collections audience in a special collections journal? We want to showcase not just how professional librarians, archivists, and curators work with special collections, but how our users and researchers work with special collections. And in that way, um, we think we give a better context and measure of the impact of cultural collections. And as mentioned before, um, it's important to take account, um, take into account the cost of journals. Um, not everyone um, has a budget like we do at UB. You know, we're a large research institution. And even then, being a large research institution, our uh, journal um, budget is being cut, which I'm sure a lot of you listening can sympathize with. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the scholarship put forth in this journal was available to everyone, not just those who could afford it. This is especially pertinent in our field where you have authors writing from all volunteer positions at local historical societies and museums. We're a diverse group in the special collections world um, with very various levels of funding support. The fact that someone wouldn't be able to read the quality work being done in librarianship because they couldn't afford it seems to go against the very nature of our profession. All right, uh, so how did we create this journal? Um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of creating a brand new open access journal. So uh, we first, we identified our niche. Um, we, we did this pretty quickly and there was some, definitely some naivete involved and a steep learning curve. Um, but we realized, as mentioned before, there was a gap in the literature and we had to figure out um, how we could address that gap. Um, so when I say we did this quickly, it was a matter of months, I think probably about six months from the idea to implementation and starting to solicit articles from authors. Uh, after you know, we identified our niche, we had to look into uh, available platforms. Um, and there, we found that there are two obvious cho choices, uh, open journal systems and Scholastica. In the end, we decided to go with the hosted platform Scholastica. And I'll be talking more about Scholastica in a little bit. Uh, so we, all, we, we talked a lot with our colleagues and um, who have varied experiences with open access publications. One of them is an editor of an open access journal. Um, and the other is had experience investigating open access platforms for journal publications. So some of the most valuable conversations we had were with our coworker, Chris Hollister, um, who was the founding editor of Communications and Information Literacy, an open access journal about information literacy. Um, we had many candid and frank conversations about the pros and cons of starting and running a journal and the rewards and challenges that were involved. Uh, we also spoke with Charles Lyons, who, um, who was able to discuss various open access platforms for us. He'd previously investigated um, these systems in the, for the library to see if, if they were viable. So um, we also spoke with him about possible funding opportunities from our library. Um, and this is where he mentioned the library's innovation grant. So uh, as I said before, we decided to go with Scholastica, but this decision was, was pretty much influenced by um, the fact that Amy and nor, neither Amy nor I are computer programmers, and open journal system does take a lot of time and knowledge to program. Um, and Scholastica, after some investigation, was a very was very very user friendly. And um, we thought from the editor's side and the peer reviewer side, um, which is something we wanted to take into account. Um, and so we had to essentially decide which platform was a better fit. Um, and we also wanted to take into account that while op open journal systems is open source, Scholastica had a fee-based $10 per submission fee. So every time someone submits an article to our journal um, to go through the peer review process, it's a $10 fee for us. And we had to decide was that something we wanted to pass along to the users or was it something that our library, library would be able to cover. So that leads us to the UB Libraries Innovation Grant. So uh, at that time, our library had funding for technical innovation grants, and we used that opportunity to apply for funding to try Scholastica and pay the $10 submission fee. Um, our application was successful, and as, as part of the award, we agreed to present our work to library faculty and staff and promote open access initiatives within the library and outside of the university. So uh, 
our goal, though, we were awarded an initial thousand dollars to try Scholastica, and um, eventually that money will run out. And our our goal is to be self sustaining. Um, after in you know in the future, after we receive royalties from various databases, who will index our journal's work? Okay, so another part of creating a journal was creating policies, and this this was this was pretty tricky. Uh, we had to decide the journal policies, such as style and formatting, image guidelines, author contracts. Uh, we had to decide which citation uh, style we wanted to use, and in the end, we decided to go with APA. Uh, we had to figure out how to solicit proposals, especially with the $10 submission fee. Um, we wanted to vet the proposals before someone submitted to, to cut down on um, possible submissions of articles that weren't appropriate. Um, you know, we didn't know if we would be getting a lot of those, um, so we had authors, potential authors, email us with their ideas ahead of time um, to see if, if it was something we would we want to have submitted to the journal. Um, and we had to use Creative Commons. We had to come up with our Creative Commons license and uh, using Spark um, and developing our author contracts with the assistance of colleagues from our law library. That was we we were very fortunate to have them to assist us. And some policies were already established by Scholastica, um, such as they had default settings for peer review um, time. So our peer reviewers, on average, get 30 days from the time um, they get 30 days to review uh, the the blind manuscript submissions. And we also had to decide too if we wanted to be a double blind, a blind, yeah, peer review journal. And in the end, we decided to go with blind submissions because um, it's meaning that the the authors wouldn't know who their peer reviewers are, but the peer reviewers would be able to see where uh, the authors were from because we figured so many of the projects that would be would be uh, would be written about would be easily identifiable. So the whole double blind pro process just seemed like it would would add an additional headache. Uh, yeah, so we decided to go with the 30, the 30 days from Scholastica, and also we, we wanted to, you know, to, to make it as fast as possible, the submission process. So, okay, so this is a screenshot from Scholastica, and uh, this was a, we did not read this article. This is um, a, just a sample article they give you, so you can see how the process works. So, um, you can see that we have, um, this is from the the uh, the editor's point of view. So it's very the the layout is very easy to use. Um, it's easy ways to invite reviewers. Um, there's a discussion section. You can write notes to each other. Uh, it's it's I found it to be very easy to use, and um, I was I've been very happy with it. And this is again this is a screen from when you're inviting reviewers to review manuscripts. Um, more, usually there's more, we invite more reviewers than just, just myself, but, uh, yeah, so this, we, we generally invite three peer reviewers, um, and then down at the bottom, you can see where you read the review. It's overall a very, very simple system for us to use. So Scholastica does, um, provide a website. So they, they host a website for you where your articles and your journal can live. Um, we decided um, here at UB that we didn't necessarily want to use this website. We still, we upload it, we keep it, we keep it up to date, but this isn't the, the website we feature uh, when we're um, giving out like the address to our, uh, the website address to our, uh, our journal. So um, you can see here, so that's the, what they gave us. We are very fortunate at UP to have a, a graphic designer and a web designer, um, Chris Miller. And Chris has designed this great website for us. So it sort of it, it mirrors um, what exists on the Scholastica website. So we have, this is just a screenshot, but we have our, um, our, our journal, um, all the past issues, um, publication information, how to contact us, policies. Um, it's all on this website. So, uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. So where are we? we ooh. Checking the time. We are zipping along. So we're, it looks like we're going to have a lot of time for questions. So don't be shy about asking us. Um, 
anymore about how we did this, why we did this, or about um, Scholastica itself. Um, we're moving on to part three of our agenda, um, and that's kind of uh, forward-looking steps. So a big, a big issue for any journal and for us in our open access journal is sustainability. And number one for us is promotion. Um, no one will read or submit to your journal if they don't know about it. And for promotion for us, consistency of effort is the most crucial point to remember. Um, we mainly rely on social media listservs and blogs. Um, we don't, you know, we have that little bit of innovation grant funding that pays for the submission fees, but we don't have additional funding at this point to say buy article space in a conference um, brochure, other things that other um, journals are able to do. So we still kind of rely on the freebie stuff, which is okay. Um, and that's mainly social media, listservs and blogs. And for us, Twitter in particular has been particularly useful and helpful, not just in getting submissions, but also in recruiting peer reviewers. Uh, associated costs. Uh, open access is not free. Um, nothing is free in life, unfortunately. There are costs in terms of your time, um, your reviewer's time, your author's time, and also the fees associated with using the hosted platform. So that's the trade-off that you make. You know, we didn't have to go to the trouble of programming and having all that technical know-how for open journal systems. Um, we've got the easy-to-use Scholastica platform but there are fees involved in that, in using that platform. Also, you need to um, engage your peer reviewers. Um, we want to do this continuously. We aim to give at least one article per year to each peer reviewer, but we also don't want them to suffer from reviewer fatigue. Um, some reviewers are more timely than others. Some meet their deadlines. That's, you know, that happens to all of us. And if you're in a bind, you don't want to go to that reviewer who gets back to you within two weeks um, over and over again. You know, you want to keep them engaged with the journal, but not overly engaged. How else do we maintain enthusiasm? Well, we do receive a good amount of submissions. But to be frank, it's not as many as we did when we first launched. So when we first announced, there was a flurry um, of submissions that came in. And we talked to editor, you know, other editors, and they all said, yes, and it's great, and enjoy it, and it will never be <laughs> this easy again. Um, you know, there's a lot of attention when you launch a new journal, and people are excited, um, and that's great. But um, after that comes the nitty-gritty hard work of kind of promoting yourself and engaging with potential authors. And it's hard not to have moments of panic and worry about having enough submissions. Um, we do steadily, but there are certain times of the year when you tend to have more than others. Um, and if you're at that low point, it can be hard to remember that. You're gonna hit that high point again soon. So what are the challenges that we've encountered, um, both in starting the journal, maintaining the journal, and in using our hosted platform? Well, I think the first thing for us that we always kind of worry about is, what if Scholastica folds? Um, pretty much all of our records are maintained in this platform. The decisions, um, the submissions, the um, edited manuscripts, I mean, that's all our who our peer reviewers are. I mean, we do have some redundancy, but um, kind of the, the files of record are all contained in Scholastica. Um, and that is a concern we have. I mean, they, they are expanding their user base. I think they're getting more and more people who are using them. I don't think folding is anything that would come up relatively soon, if at all, but it is something that's in the back of your mind and something you need to be aware of. Also, what happens if we don't become self-sustaining? You know, what if um, the indexing royalties aren't as much as we're estimating that they are? What will we do if the library decides that they're not going to renew the initial grant? Um, we've been assured that it will, but 
you know, money changes, budgets change. This is the world we live in. And um, we rely on funding a lot from year to year that sometimes uh, goes away. Two other things that are kind of related are student articles and immediate publication. So when we started, um, we wanted it to be open access, we wanted it to be all inclusive, and we wanted articles from people who use special collections and not just work in them. And one of the groups we wanted to include was students. So students who work with special collections or PhD scholars who are working with special collections, we wanted to include them um, as part of our contributors. And the PhD scholars, I think we've hit that audience, but with library and archive students, I think we've um, missed the mark a little bit. We haven't received anywhere near the amount of submissions or the kind of the type of submissions that we were looking for. So accepting student work is still one of our policies and it's something we'll continue to pursue, but it hasn't worked out so far the way that we had hoped. Um, and hopefully we can change that for the future. One of our other goals was immediate publication. And by that, um, I mean, once, in our, once we receive an article and it goes all through the editing process, copy editing is complete. We wanted to publish it immediately online. Um, and then once or twice a year when we did our issue, we would collate all of those articles into an issue. That hasn't quite worked out the way that we wanted. Um, we're still kind of publishing all the articles in an issue at once instead of as they're finished. Um, and a lot of that is just due to timelines and deadlines and when the, the articles so far have happened to be completed around the same time. So it seemed kind of what was the point in, in doing them immediately within a couple of weeks if, if we just waited two more weeks, we could kind of launch the entire the entire issue. Yeah. And another thing, this is Molly speaking, um, just these things that popped up that we didn't even anticipate, especially regarding the um, immediate publication, was we were hoping that, yeah, we wanted to put them up as soon as they were accepted and copy edited and everything. But things they wouldn't even think about popped up like, well, if we put it up now, how does someone cite this paper for the page numbers if it's not collated yet things that yeah we hadn't anticipated on just popped up so it with our limited time because editing a journal is not the only thing we do um we just decided to do them all together at one time so maybe this is something that we'll revisit in the future but for right now we're sticking with with this for the time being yeah um oh one other thing to be aware of um our technical issues, as we said, we're not um, we're not programmers. We're also not IT specialists. But you chose this platform. This is what your reviewers, your um, your authors are using. And if they have trouble with the platform, with using it, with signing in, with getting it to accept their submission, their review, they're going to contact you, and you are the conduit um, for their IT help. So that's something to be aware of, and that has been a little bit of a challenge. But I will say that the Scholastica help desk is fantastic. They are particularly responsive. And I'm gonna go on the record, I will say they are faster and more responsive than even our own IT. And that's not a slam against our IT, mm -hmm. but it's just how, how fast and um, I would say kind of an example of how uh, well-funded and resourced Scholastica is, mm -hmm. um, that they're able to respond that quickly. So what have we learned um, in the, gosh, it's been two years. Mm -hmm. we're, at, we're at just about our two year anniversary of beginning this, this process. One is to have enough reviewers um, and get as much information as possible from your reviewers. So by that, we mean um, when somebody sends us an email and they say they're interested, we ask them, how many times a year can you review? What types of articles do you want to review? What types do you not want to review? What are you absolutely don't know anything about and it would not, um, it's just not in your interest to review and it wouldn't be great for the author either. You know, we have kind of a, a spreadsheet with all of these metrics um, contained. Um, at the time that we did that, Scholastica wasn't, they didn't have so much of, they didn't have that ability mm -hmm. yet. 
to maintain that information about reviewers. They do now. So our spreadsheet is kind of a redundancy, but it's really important to know who's reviewing for you, what they can do, and what they would like to do. Also negotiating with authors and reviewers. Um, you know, writing is really personal. Um, it's personal output and it can be difficult sometimes to accept editing or criticism. Um, it can be difficult to express editing or criticism in an email um, and with notes on a manuscript. Sometimes, you know, talking with somebody in person um, is a better way to go. And we have had times where we'll have a phone conversation with an author and not just rely on email. Sometimes we rely on email um, and the manuscript, but it is you know, it, it is something that um, at times can be relatively smooth and at times it's a little bit bumpy, but you need to keep in mind that, you know, we're all here to have the best article that we can published. Um, and we want that and the author wants that. Also in terms of peer reviewers, you know, reviewing is a skill in and of itself. Um, some reviewers are better at that than others. Some are better at expressing that criticism. Um, one issue we've had is some reviewers, there, there are two um, kind of sections that a reviewer fills out when they review an article for us. One is the notes that go to the author, and we send those to the author. They're not, we don't edit them in any way as they write it is what the author gets. And the other section is just for the editor. And occasionally you'll have a reviewer that will write terrific criticism and offer great um, kind of suggestions for how to improve the article in the notes to the editor, but they won't write that same text to the author. Sometimes they're very, very brief in, in the feedback they give the author. Um, I, I don't know why, but I, I, I've talked to other reviewers and other fields, and I think this is just, this is a problem. Sometimes people are a little reticent to say what they want to, to the author. Um, and, you know, we do pass along the concerns that they send to the editor, but I, I really would prefer, I think, if our reviewers sometimes could be a little bit more explicit to the author itself since we don't edit those remarks. And I think it's important to get that feedback from your colleagues exactly as they wrote it um, and to not kind of pass through the editorial filter sometimes. Sometimes you really need to hear exactly what your colleagues are saying. Also, uh, one thing we learned, I think this is the most important sometimes, is what you don't know is powerful. Um, a little naivete and a lot of can-do spirit can be really helpful in an endeavor such as this. Also, you need to remember that in starting a journal, you really need to have a desire to and an enjoyment in connecting your authors to readers um, and in insisting your author, assisting your authors in making their articles the best that it can be. That really needs to be uh, um, your main goal. Um, it, this can't be something that you want to do because you need to get tenure and you want to check this off some sort of a box. Um, you know, this this needs this. I don't want to say it's a calling, but you know, it does. It is something you need to be passionate about. We think. Mm -hmm. So we have a few bits of advice um, from what we've discovered so far, and from what we've learned from talking to other editors and other colleagues. Um, one is to know and play to your strengths. So for us, again, we're not programmers, so instead of struggling with OJS, we used a hosted service. Start small and keep your goals manageable. Um, when we started, two of our main goals were to have one issue per year and 50 reviewers. For us, that seemed like a huge goal. We actually ended up doing two issues our first year, and we had over 100 reviewers, which was great. Um, but one issue per year and 50 was manageable, was doable. Um, when you achieve your goals, then you gain confidence um, and you're able to move forward. So number three, it's really, really important then to have goals. You have to have goals. You have to know what you want to accomplish. It sounds basic, but you need to be very explicit about your goals and everybody on your team needs to know what those goals are. Also, you have to have a timeline that's both flexible, but also has hard deadlines. Authors and reviewers don't always meet your deadlines. Um, 
you know, all of us authors, reviewers, and both Molly and myself and Maria, our third editor, we all have day jobs. Everybody has a day job. You know, we're all doing this in our off time. Um, all of us have rapidly changing workloads, and all of that can affect your timeline. So you need to know when you want your articles, um, you know, in and edited and ready to go to be published, but kind of getting from here to there, uh, your timeline's going to vary a little bit. So you, you need to have a little bit of flexibility and you need to balance that with your day job, with what you're doing from day to day in your position. Also, in terms of a timeline, um, I think initially we thought that there would be certain times of the year where we would be extremely busy with the journal and then certain times where we would have a lot of downtime. And I don't think that's quite the case. Um, the six weeks or so the around publication are the most intense, but this really is more of a year-round activity. It's not, it's not seasonal. Um, there really is no, uh, no downtime where there's, there's nothing to do. One other thing to keep in mind with your deadlines is even with the best planning, even with everybody um, on board with what you're trying to accomplish, everything takes longer than you think it will take. Everything takes longer. Getting the peer reviewers to submit their reviews, having the authors complete their um, contracts, contracts mm -hmm. um, anything they need to change on their article, copy editing, everything takes a little bit longer than you think. Also, if you're going to start a journal, um, you need to be very explicit in assigning your tasks. So who's doing what? Um, who's editing this, this article? Who's sending out for reviewers? Who's going to shepherd this article from submission to publication? Um, what's the exact workflow that you're going to use from proposal to submission? I mean, when I say explicit, I mean, you need to write this out. Like, get yourself a big old-timey whiteboard and map it out um, because it's going to change. You need to be able to erase it. Um, but everybody needs to know what's going on at any given point, what needs to be done, what has been done, and so forth. Also, ask for help. Um, you know, writing and publication is not a solo activity. It just isn't. Um, edit, editing is not a solo activity. So ask for help from your colleagues. Um, like we went to our, our friends in the law library to help us in writing the author contracts. You know, I'm not a lawyer. They're not lawyers either, but they have far more experience than we do. Um, and it made sense to, you know, let's, let's hone that, let's grab that expertise. They're here to help. Um, so they helped us with that. Uh, we went to other journal editors. Um, people come to us. Uh, we do webinars like this. Um, there's all sorts of avenues for help. Um, and you shouldn't be shy about seeking that help and about seeking other opinions and ways of accomplishing, you know, your goals and your tasks. Um, everybody has, you know, you learn from everybody who's come before you. So you really need to keep that in mind um, and use that to your advantage. And I'd also say that Scholastica actually provides, they provide ebooks, stuff about, it's not necessarily, you know, editing for dummies, but it's, it's, it's pointers, it's, it's um, experience from other journal editors. Um, they have a pretty good community um, on their website and um, publications that they've, they've created to give tips about the whole entire process, which I found very, very helpful. And they do kind of have um, social media-like uh, tools mm -hmm. on their website for editors to kind of connect with other editors, with other people that work on journals to figure out what's worked. You know, if you did something new for um, promotion, how did that work? What did you do that failed spectacularly? Um, and they do kind of work really hard to link us all together so that um, all of our journals can be better. We're pretty good on time. We've got some time for questions. This is good. Yeah. So we want to thank you all very much for taking the time today to talk with us. Um, we've got some links here for both myself and Molly, and we also have a link to our journal webpage and also to the Scholastica webpage if you're interested in it. Not to, I mean, I want to do a commercial form, but it, they can set you up with um, a little kind of video. Mm -hmm. um, you just sign up and they'll send you the video so you can see how it works if you're interested in using it. 
um, it's a great tool. And with that, if, if there are any questions, we're happy to answer them. Great. Thank you so much. I'm glad we do have some time for questions because there are some good ones in the chat window. Um, so Molly and Amy, you kind of alluded to this a little bit, um, but John Schumacher from Olus is asking, um, is your work on the journal included in official job programs or job duties? And I want to elaborate on that just a little bit. Does that factor into promotion and tenure in any way? It can. Um, writing or editorial work and or editorial work is something that can be um, included in tenure at various levels. Um, so, you know, whether you're in a, here we have, there's different levels. So you can be an assistant librarian, an associate librarian, or a full librarian. And there are kind of certain you know, they always say excellence at the job is mm -hmm. number one in tenure, but uh, it, let's be frank, we all know it's publishing. Um, editing a journal is actually something that they look for at the full librarian level here, mm -hmm. and both Molly and I are not at that level yet. At some point it will be helpful, yes, in tenure or promotion, but I don't think our goal was to achieve tenure as much as it was when we were writing and we looked around at places we wanted to publish, we really felt that there was a there was a niche, there was a place that was lacking, not just in where we wanted to send our articles, but also the kind of articles, frankly, we wanted to read, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. I don't know how else you want to talk. You have anything else you want to add about tenure? Um, I mean, it, it's not in our it's official not, job. Description. No, it's not. It's definitely not in our official job description. I think it just goes towards, you know, professional contributions in your, um, I mean, it's, it's on my CV, but it's not, I don't think it's what's going to get me tenure. You yeah. know, it's excellence in the job and scholarly publications and engagement. Yeah. Kind of like going to conferences in yeah. a way or being involved in organizations, you know, that's all encouraged. Um, and there's, I suppose there's some level of expectation, but it's, there's not like a checkbox or it's not a specific, you know, in your conditions of employment letter, mm -hmm. you will do this. Right. You know, it really is entirely, it's entirely up to you. Mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a real passion project. Um, and it's really nice to see, um, you know, the, the great website and, and everything like that. There are quite a few people asking if you can elaborate on your goal of being self-sustaining. Um, so in terms of you know database royalties, I get the sense that people are asking, how does that work? Um, and also, as far as um, you know, being self-sustaining, is there any kind of advancement or development opportunities that you see? And, and by uh, that, I mean, um, you know, like basically fundraising to support that. Yeah. Like Kickstarter or something. Yeah. I mean, we always, we always have the option of, of, of charging authors the $10 and that sets a precedent. It though. sets a precedent yeah. and I'm not comfortable with that. Okay. I don't, I don't like that option, but some people have to do it. And I understand, um, the, the, so, the royalties, as I understand it, is that once a journal, one of the big journal or the big databases, picks up your journal to include in a package um, that you might get, let's say, for example, JSTOR. You know, you're included in this package of you know social sciences and library information studies. For I'm just making that up, but let's say you, your library buys that package, um, you will get royalties. I'm not sure of the amount. But I'm I've been assured it's it's enough to keep us going. Yeah, it's, it's not enough. a huge I mean nobody gets rich in this yes. at all, but it's it's enough to cover the ten bucks. Let's yes, put it exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll <laughs> it'll cover the ten bucks. Um so that's that's how I understand it working. We're not there yet. That can take a couple of years from what I understand to get um picked up. Um actually from being in the IR, um we, we put all our articles in the UB institutional repository. And authors with a Creative Commons license are free to put their published works in their IR, their own institution's IR. And I know journal articles come up in Google Scholar because of it. So and Pro, Pro I, I believe we're also in ProQuest. Someone here, I think, added us. So um, we'll see. I'm not. We haven't been indexed yet. So in a big uh, 
in a big database. So um, I, I think we talked to another edit, another open access editor, and if I remember right, he said it's like a, about three years. He said mm -hmm. you, you may be quicker; it could be two years, but he said it's about two to three years. They want to see uh, a certain number of issues a yeah. year. You know, one of the reasons why when we had enough submissions to go to two articles a year was you have a greater chance of being yes. indexed if you publish at least two issues a year. So we did that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few more things we have to do to kind of increase our yeah. chances. But yeah. but we're assuming maybe another year to 18 months. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll Hopefully. start to see something coming in. But in the meantime, our library has assured us that yeah. they will help um, fund us because it's relatively you know, it, it is relatively inexpensive yeah. in, the, in the greater issue of um, of things. It's pretty yeah. cheap for them. So. Right. Yeah. And yeah. once we do get indexed, it's we're not going to stop being an open access publication. We no, will no. continue to offer our articles freely. It's just that they'll show up in these databases mm -hmm. when someone does a search. I, don't know, I really cool? like. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, we we're just, just we just want to know if that answered the question. Oh, yeah, I, I think it did. There's there's lots of options there. And in the chat, um, uh, where did it go? Megan L. from ULM said, my OAJ receives about $80 twice a year from EBSCO. So I'm sure that yeah. that varies um, widely, but, you know, there's, there's an example. So if you're publishing eight um, issues, uh, or excuse me, eight articles an issue, then, you know, that, that's, that's sustaining. Um, I really liked how you articulated that you want to connect authors with readers and readers authors. And Kim Myers from Brockport says, what kinds of dashboard metrics are are provided? So what does Scholastica do in terms of you know metrics? Yeah, so Scholastica really has a great um and I didn't I sort of glossed over this in the presentation. They do have a really great um metrics and built-in analytics program so we can gauge things like editor performance acceptance rate average day to decision um, manuscript progress um, peer reviewer time for each peer reviewer it gives them like well this so you can see if someone's consistently early or if someone's consistently late um, but that we also realized this would be a little tricky if we had our own hosted website so we also um, the Google or the Scholastica analytics don't tell you how many people visited your site, for example. So it's it's almost two types of analytics. So you have your mm -hmm. your metrics from your the, the journal side of things, but then the metrics of you know who's looking the Google Analytics side of like who web traffic, like who's looking at your site. So we have Google Analytics on our own website. Um, we but, also get metrics from if somebody ac accesses an article in the IR. That's so we right. Get those yeah, we so do. We, we, we get do three get sets, those. Actually. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a lot of information is being produced. So, um, like, so for example, um, our our initial goal when we started off was that um, from forty five days from submission to decision, with minimal revision. So let's say we got an uh, an article that was very close to being being able to be published. Um, we wanted to have forty five days. I'm looking at that now, and I'm kind of laughing at myself, but um, <laughs> origin so for our first issue, for example, these were the metrics that Scholastica provided, um, it was an on an average of 77 days from submission to decision. So it was in 66 days to reject and 88 days to accept. So those are just some, some statistics from when we first started off. So things have changed since then. Um, but uh, yeah, no, the, the, uh, the metrics that we get from Scholastica, I think are very, very useful. Mm -hmm. And they're getting better. I think it's as good as they are. I think it's still in beta, I think. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're still trying to refine it. And one thing we like about Scholastica is they really engage with you um, and will periodically check in with us and mm -hmm. ask us what's working with the software, with yep. the platform, and what isn't. Um, and they really do take that into account and make those changes. So yeah. um, I think they're still kind of getting their feedback from the metrics before they're they're ready to go, but so, I, so far we're really happy with it. Mm -hmm. So in your presentation, you mentioned um, that you were looking at the different interfaces and different capabilities and capacities of the different systems. I was wondering, did you think about the user's experience? So what would the author's look experience look like in these different systems? Mm 
Yeah, and from our experience, I mean, I've worked as a peer reviewer in certain um, OJS systems before. And, you know, you can get by. It's fine. You know, it's a little, little clunky, if I might say so. Um, but, you know, it's fine. Um, for the, the Scholastica experience, we found to be much more robust and easy to use. The user experience, for our opinion, um, was just much better. Um, with Scholastica. It, it kind of mimics social media. So mm -hmm. when you log in, you can put a profile picture, you can put interests and mm -hmm. things, um, you know, what your specializations are. Um, you can see the manuscripts that you've, you've submitted and where you are in that process. It's just, um, I think it's very familiar to other things people are already using. So uh, we liked that about mm -hmm. it. You know, if you're an author, you just want to get your article in. You don't want to go through a million hoops and technicalities mm -hmm. that don't need to be there. Because that, again, it's just like us being programmers. That's that's not your goal, and that's not our goal either. So it seems like you consulted with a wide group of people as you were, you know, building your information base and you know moving towards the publication piece. But was there anything unexpected that you experienced throughout this process? Unexpected. Hmm. You already uh, prepared for the unprepared. I, I, yeah, I, I think we were prepared to be unprepared yes, in some ways yeah. or to expect anything, but there. Um, I mean, it's still every day is a learning process with this journal. I mean, we've been doing it for, for two years now and we're still learning as we're going. Um, it's been well, fairly games, smooth. It's been fairly smooth, I think. Um, I'm trying to think maybe with the layout or anything. I get maybe with laying out the first issue. Yeah, that, that was a bit of an eye opener. That was a, that took longer than we thought. Um, you know, we have a great graphic designer on staff here, and we sat down with him ahead of time, and you know, we talked about how we wanted it to look and kind yeah. of the flavor we wanted it to have, but saying that and all saying that you're in agreement and then actually laying out the journal um yeah you, you know everybody's got an opinion what color should this be how big should the font be you know all of that kind of took i think we were thinking layout of those five articles would take a week and it took appreciably longer yeah i think part of it too was that we sent out the cop the the, the laid out article to authors and when they had edits to make, we couldn't make those edits in Word. We had to go back. We had to make those edits in InDesign, which is what um, Chris uses to, to lay out our articles. So InDesign, so if you you add a sentence, your all your, your pagination gets screwed up. Um, and it, it that was a bit of a headache. Yeah, that so was, there are definitely technicalities like that yeah. that I think we've run into, but nothing insurmountable. Right. You know? We worked through it. It's, Sanely as we could. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think that was, yeah. Somewhat to re related to that, um, a, a couple people have asked about copy editing. So do you, who does your copy editing? We do. Yeah, we are still, yeah, we're still, you know, we're, we're learning still very much as we go along. We wanted to start off doing everything, you know, starting the journal, we do everything, you know, which is kind of looking back a little bit insane, but um, we wanted to fully understand the process of, you know, someone proposing an article all the way to having a finished issue. So we are still doing that and we're, um, we're rethinking maybe who does what, um, because as it is now, someone gets assigned an article. An article comes in, let's say it goes to Amy and Amy's in charge of talking to the author she's in charge of that article. So as it stands now, she'd be in charge of the copy editing of that article, sending out the author contracts and all that sort of thing. Um, we're in, we're also still in the process of setting up our editorial board. We, that is going to be co coming soon, I guess, and pro hopefully within the next year, I guess for yeah. us soon means a year, but. Um, I think one of the reasons too, we wanted to do everything yeah. so that as we bring people on, we can better prepare them yes. for what, what they're going to need to do. You know, ideally we would have exactly one copy editor for the entire journal for all the issues. And I think that's our goal and hopefully we'll get there. But in the meantime, um, 
you know, by doing it ourselves, when we bring that copy editor on, we can tell them what their time commitment's gonna be, because again, the, all of this work is, it's volunteer, it's not paid, and it's all done, you know, along with your day job. So it, it kind of, um, I, I think it, it's good for us to do the whole thing from start to finish and be in, in creating the journal. And then within the next year or so, we'll bring on even more people. We just added a third editor, which has been a great experience so far. So. Um, we'll continue to bring people on as we move forward. Well, thank you too for sharing so much. I can really feel how excited and interested and dedicated you are. So it's been a really great um, sharing uh, time today. So thank you again. And I also want to thank all of our attendees. I really want to encourage you to take just two minutes to review this webinar, this series, and provide us with just a little bit of feedback, which will help us focus our future open access efforts. Um, your input is really highly valued, and I appreciate, and I'm sure the committee appreciates you spending some time with us today. Um, if you know someone who would like to see this webinar but couldn't make it today, or if you had to leave, or if you missed a webinar, um, all of the webinars will be posted on the SUNY Open Access website. Um, the previous three are already up. Um, it might take a few days to get the next two up, so please just be a little bit patient. And the chat uh, window has the URL. Um, there's one more webinar this week. Tomorrow, Jill Saracella from CUNY is going to talk about understanding and protecting your rights as an author. So that will be our last webinar as part of this series. Um, and thank you again to Molly and Amy from The Reading Room. And thank have you. a great day.